What's up, CY? Hey, no feedback. I like that. Good job, Dane. Well, hey, how's our week going? Good, yeah, maybe. Can I make it better for you? That's what I'm talking about. Let me tell you how to make this week better, okay? Raise your hand if you're going to R3. Are you not going to R3? Why? What are you competing in? Law. Law? And we're talking about how the law was abolished by the death of Jesus tonight. And so that's pretty interesting. You sure you still want to miss Jesus' time for the law? Well, if you are going to R3 weekend, uh, this time next week, we will be on a bus. Uh, not next week. This time in nine days, we'll be on a bus on the way to R3 next Friday. Are y'all ready? If you're, if you're not sleeping now, I would recommend that you, you, you start sleeping now. Um, but it's going to be a good time. I want to open with a story tonight. And I think you guys, y'all might like it. Y'all may not care. But uh, a few years ago, Dora and I had a house in Josephine, Texas. Does anyone know where Josephine is? Yeah. So you drive to the middle of nowhere and then you keep going and you'll find Josephine, okay? Our, we lived in the middle of nowhere. We had like an acre and a half of land. Uh, our neighbors were a cornfield and a water tower. And then like one other house on the street, like nowhere. Like pitch black at night, middle of nowhere. Um, it was so bad that like whenever they would harvest the cornfield, like the mice from the cornfield would like run over into our house. In one year, we killed like 40 mice in our house. Like no bueno, Okay. So the house was a smaller house, like the living room, the dining room, and the kitchen were all one open area. And then there was this hallway that went down the middle of the house, and there was two bedrooms on one side, a bathroom. And then our master bedroom was on the very end of the hallway on the left side. And one night, it was like midnight, I was in the bathroom brushing my teeth, Dora was in bed reading, and we had a black lab named Samson. And Samson was the chillest dog in the world. Uh, but to this night, uh, in, in the dark of Josephine, Texas, he was like sitting like at the door, staring at the door. And I'd taken my contacts out. I was going to bed and Dora was like, babe, I think someone is in the house. And I was like, no, there's no one in the house. We have glass break sensors. We have motion sensors. We have sensors on the windows and on the doors. Like there's no one in the house. And she said, well, something is in the house. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll check. So I keep in mind, I take my contacts out. I'm blind, like blind, blind without contacts. Like, I wouldn't be able to see you without contacts. I probably, I wouldn't be able to see silhouettes without contacts. Like, I'm blind, okay? So my contacts were out, and I was just like, fine. So, like, I opened the bedroom door. The only light in the house is shining from behind me in the bedroom, like, down the sliver of the door and, like, kind of down the hallway. And I looked down the hallway, and there's this long black rope in the middle of the hallway. <sighs> yeah, and I looked at it, and I was like, what is that? And when I said there was like, boom, like underneath the guest bedroom door, and it was a snake. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh. And Dora was like, is like, what? And I was like, pack your stuff, we're leaving the house. And she was like, you're joking with me. And I said, no, I'm not joking you. We, like, pack your things, we're going. She's like, what is it? I said, it's a snake. She's like, what kind? And I was like, I don't know. Like, it's just a big snake. And it went into the guest bedroom. And she's like, where in the bedroom? I said, the door is closed and I don't know. It could be under the bed, behind the dresser, under the nightstand. Like, I don't know. And I'm not going to go find it because that's dumb. Pack your things, we're leaving. And she's like, where are we going to go? I said, my mama's house. And so I called my mom, and I was like, hey, we're coming. So we packed our bags, but then we had to get, like, past that door to get out of the house. And so it was kind of like a, like, through the door. But before I left, I was like, wait, what happens if it gets out of the room after we're gone? I'm not going to know where it is. So I put three, st three uh, sticks of, like, duct tape, sticky side up, in front of the door. And then we left. And I went to work that day, and I went to academy that day, and I bought like one of those like extended like fishing nets, 
and like the trash pick rubbers with the cloth, so I could, like I could grab its neck. Like, no, it's not going to happen. But I go back to the house that night, and Dora's staying in the car, and I open the door, and I see this giant clump of duct tape in the middle of the hallway, and I was like, oh, bro, I got out. So as I walk up to it, what I've realized is this massive snake has wrapped itself up in the duct tape and died. Crazy, right? And so when you think about it, the snake tried to leave the room, right, or whatever they do, and it hit the duct tape, and instead of, like, waiting for help, it tried to get out of the duct tape and ended up wrapping itself up more in the duct tape and suffocated and died. And just for the end of the story, I'm, like, carrying this thing out of the house like this, and Dora's in the car, and she's like, you weren't lying, and I was like, no, I don't want to go stay at my mom's house at midnight for no reason. It was a real snake. It was crazy. But I think about it, and I think that's oftentimes how we do things. When we struggle with sin, when we struggle with ideas, when we get stuck, instead of letting someone help us, we do our best to get out of it on our own. Instead of confessing sin to one another, instead of going into scripture, instead of going into prayer, we think that we can depend on ourselves, on our strength, on our abilities, on our know-how to get ourselves out of the situation that we were very capable of getting ourselves into. But what ends up happening is we end up getting into a much bigger mess where sin becomes our life and then we, we find joy in the sin and then our identity becomes in the sin and then we get comfortable in sin and then before we know it we are so lost in sin that we would be considered dead in spirit. And so tonight what we're going to look at is we're going to look at living a virtuous life. And if you're writing down notes, the title of the message is A Virtuous Life. And we're going to look at the fruit of the Spirit and what it requires of us. And we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5. And so if y'all want to turn there, um, you are welcome to. And we're going to pray and then then we'll jump in. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the freedom to gather and eat unhealthy pizza and play games and to worship and to hear your word, Lord. I pray that you would speak tonight through the text of scripture, that you would speak through me, Father, that whatever is said uh, would be from you. Lord, if it is from you, Father, would it, would it grab hold of, of hearts and souls? Would it, would it change lifestyles? Would it change thought process, Lord? But if it's from me, um, Lord, would it not leave this room in any heart, in any mind, in any um, assumption or, or, or anything else, Father? Would it just fall dead on deaf ears, Father, but would your spirit dwell, would your spirit move, Um, Lord, would your words come to life as we study them, and would they they bring conviction, and would they bring a desire to love you more? Father, we give you this evening, we give you the next uh, 30 minutes of time, Father, would you have your way with this message, Lord? We ask that you would move in a mighty way, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone that loved Jesus said, amen. Amen. So we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5. We're going to really just kind of like camp out in verses 16 through 26. But before we do, I kind of want to recap verses 1 through 15 so you kind of get a picture of what's going on in in this chapter. So what's going on right now is Paul is writing a letter to the Galatians to walk in spirit. And, And in this current time in Galatians, there was really two beliefs. There was a belief that the law needs to be upholded. And then there's a belief that you need to walk by faith. Uh, to believe in Jesus and have salvation. And there were some people that believed that they could kind of do both, where they could say that Jesus is real, but then really try to uphold all that the law was. But what Paul is saying is that the people who love the law will profit nothing. The people that try to keep all of the law, it was like 600 and something laws that they had to keep, that the people that fought to keep those laws and basically earn or work their way to salvation would profit nothing from Jesus. And I think how tragic that must be. How tragic it would be for Jesus dying on a cross, pouring out his blood, his life, his soul, his pain, and his love for us, that it would profit us nothing. And I think to the two men on the cross, there was Jesus on the middle cross and two men beside him. And we know, most of us know the story that one man spoke with Jesus and and gave his life to Jesus and put his faith in Jesus and he inherited the kingdom of God. But the man on the other cross who did not put his faith in Jesus, it profited him nothing. And last week we learned about works. I remember Rance taught last week, and 
uh, he opened up with two pictures, and they were kind of the same, and we spotted the differences. Do you all remember that? And he talked about, at the end, he put up a, a really uh, large, uh, almost obnoxious picture of himself, and he said, what's the difference? And the difference, although it was funny, was, was apparently clear that something was different between the pictures. And then the takeaway was, are you living in such a way that those of you who love Jesus, it is a noticeable difference in your life. And so we're going to kind of take that one step further. So we're going to read, actually I'm going to read Galatians 13 and 14. And this is kind of where, this is the pivot into uh, 14, 15, and 16. This is a pivot into verse 16 where we're, going to, where we're going to camp out. And it says, For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law, again talking to the people that believe the law still needed to be upheld, is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out or you will be consumed by one another. So what he's saying here is that we were called to be free. The death of Jesus on the cross, the resurrection, three days later, means that we are free. Therefore, we are no longer confined to the requirements and the restraints of the law, but to live in a life of faith and in spirit with the Holy Spirit unleashed from heaven down to indwell in our souls to be free. But the freedom that we now live in is not for us, but for us to, though, give to other people. And then to the people that were still abiding by the law, he said, the entire law that you are trying to keep is now fulfilled by one commandment, to love one another as yourself. And now we're going to go verse 16 through 21, and this is what it says. I say then, walk by the Spirit, but by the Spirit and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the spirit, and the spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other. So that you don't, what, what you don't do what you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual morality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions and factions, envy and drunkenness, caressing, and anything similar. I am warning you about these things, as I have warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So first point tonight, a virtuous life is sacrificial. A virtuous life is sacrificial. And simply put, what he's saying in verses 16 through 21 is you must walk in the Spirit. And walking in the Spirit in this term literally means walking side by side with the Spirit through your life. It's like you were walking with a friend in a park and having a conversation. It is continuous communication. It is continuous contact. It is continuous accountability. We are to walk in the Spirit. We have this confidence walking in the Spirit, and we, and we see it here. That if you walk in the Spirit, you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. And so what Paul is saying is, hey, if you abide in the Spirit, if you, if you walk in the Spirit, if you are in the Word, if you are in prayer, if you are in community, if you are abiding by what Jesus desires, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. But what he paints is kind of this, this ongoing picture, this ongoing battle of our mortal flesh and our spiritual bodies. So we are born into sin, and then we receive Christ. So we have a spirit of Jesus that lives inside of us, and we have this ongoing fleshly desire to sin that are constantly battling it out, each wanting to destroy one another. And oftentimes in our lives, I know you've probably heard it, there is a lie that has gained a lot of steam. And it says this. Do what makes you happy. Has anyone ever heard someone say that they're just going to do what makes them happy or they're just going to invest in themselves or take care of themselves or do anything that they want? But what Paul is saying is like, no, walking in the spirit means you will not do what you want to do, but you will abide in the desires of the spirit. You see, the, the problem is, is our flesh is trained for rebellion, our flesh is trained for sin, for selfishness, to rebel against authority, to rebel against righteousness. But the Spirit of God is designed and operates in such a way that compels us to Christ, that compels us to righteousness, that gives us a desire to glorify 
God and further his name. You see, the spirit inside of us calls us to a life of sacrifice. Doing the things that we don't want to do or that are uncomfortable or not for our sake, but for the sake of the gospel and glorifying God. Living a virtuous life is sacrificial because it could mean sacrificing multiple things. For example, a a virtuous life or a sacrificial life for Christ could mean a change in your job or your career. You could be doing something that you love and the Lord says, hey, I know you're really good at this and you really enjoy this, but I really need you to go over here. In a sacrificial life, the answer is simply, yes, Lord. It could be ending a relationship that you're in that is not glorifying the Lord and you may love this person, you may think this person is in game and the Lord says, hey, I don't need you in that relationship. I need you to walk in a life of of singleness for this time being. Or it could be finances. You could want a job that makes you incredibly rich and the Lord says, hey, actually, no, I don't think that's it for you. I think I need you to live a life of simplicity and hard work and doing what I ask you to do. It could be you have a desire to stay in America and work and get married and have kids and the Lord is saying, no, I need you to go to an unreached tribe in the middle of a jungle and share my gospel, would your answer still be simply, yes, Lord? You see, Paul even goes as far as to say, if you live in the flesh, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. You see, a life in the flesh or a life that is works-based does not inherit the kingdom of God. And I think a lie that we believe and a lie that we tell ourselves or allow to be told to ourselves that we believe is that, hey, it's okay if if, if you're not if you don't have it figured out, it's okay if you sin a little bit. It's okay if this is your main sin. It's not as bad as this sin. It's okay if you continue to do this sin because it's not killing someone. But what Paul is saying is, hey, a works-based life does not inherit the kingdom of God. A spirit-led life does inherit the kingdom of God. We cannot win the war against our flesh alone. You see, like the snake in my house, it gets stuck in the trap and it tries to get itself out and then it just gets worse and worse and worse and it ends in death. A lot of times we are confronted with a sin or with a feeling or with a thought and we think, oh, it'll go away or, well, this is the last time I'm going to do this sin. This is the last time I'm going to log into the the wrong website. This is the last time I'm going to take a drink from this bottle. This is the last time I'm going to smoke whatever this is. And we think that we are strong enough and capable enough to get over sin on our own. But the truth is we were born into sin. In fact, your flesh desires it. There is nothing holy and nothing righteous that apart from the Lord you will desire on your own because it is uncomfortable, it is selfless, and we were born to be comfortable, selfish beings. That's why time in the word is vital. You hear us say you need to be in the word, you need to be in prayer, you need to be in community And this is why, because whatever you are struggling with, whether it be depression, whether it be addiction, whether it be anything in between that spectrum, selfishness, anger, jealousy, envy, idolatry, whatever it may be, you are incapable of doing it alone. And so you need this word, you need prayer, you need our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then we look at the sins that it mentions. Sexual morality, impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred. Anyone say they hate anything before? You may not mean it, but you said it. Anyone deal with random outbursts of anger or strife or envy? You see something that someone else has and you're like, man, I really want that. And you think about it and you dream about how much money you would have to make. Or man, if I just won the lottery, I could have what they have. Paul is saying all of these attributes do not inherit the kingdom of God. So a question for you tonight is, are you, are you trying to work your way to heaven? Are you trying to manage sin in such a way that it can be presentable to, to people in your life that would accept it? Or are you trying to hide it or conceal it in such a way that people may not know about it? Are you trying to work your way to heaven? Another question for you is, is do you depend on yourself or do you depend on the Spirit? When you wake up in the morning, do you think that you have what it takes to live a life righteous for Christ 
on your own accord? Or do you wake up dependent on the Lord for your daily bread to forgive you your trespasses, to give you the ability to forgive others? Do you think that you're almost good enough and you're just, it's just a little bit more, man, if I could just do one more thing, if I could just work on one more thing, then I would have it. Versus saying, Father, like I have missed it. And I need your forgiveness and your spirit and your grace to walk with me through this process. Or is there a sin that you've accepted as part of who you are? Is there a sin that you know is wrong, but it's justifiable or it's easy to conceal? And so rather than confronting this sin, it's easier to just manage it and say that it's good enough because, yeah, I go to church and, and I pray and uh, I, I serve in my youth group. And so like this sin isn't really that bad because my good outweighs the bad. Or do you live a life in accordance with? to the Spirit, sacrificially giving up the things that you want so that the Lord can be glorified. It's not easy. And most of the time it's not even really for us, it's for the people around us, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But a virtuous life is sacrificial. Next, we're going to read Galatians 22 through 24 that says this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law, again talking about the things that must be kept, is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Point two, a virtuous life is evident. We touched on it last week and we're going to do a deeper dive. You see, when we think about the sins in our life and everything that could be sinful, anger, yelling at someone, uh, being jealous of someone, envy, pornography, addiction, um, all of those things, secrecy, lying, dishonesty, the flesh seems really overwhelming because it is. Sin is all around us. And if you don't believe me, just watch the news or scroll through reels on Instagram or watch TikTok or go on Facebook. Like, sin is everywhere both in us and around us. But here's the thing, God is good enough and big enough to change everything in your life with the fruit of the Spirit. You see, the fruit of the Spirit can always conquer the works of the flesh because the works of the flesh are things that we do and perpetuate on our own, and the fruit of the Spirit comes from the Lord who is all-powerful, all-surpassing, and can help you and give you the strength necessary to overcome it. You see, the opposite of works and sin is the fruit of the Spirit. The opposite of love is hate. The opposite of joy is sadness. The opposite of peace is anxiety. So they cannot coexist in the same world. And here's the cool thing about fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is not achieved by working but by abiding. And this is really important. The fruit of the Spirit is not something that you obtain it's not a checklist of saying, okay, once you read your Bible for this many days, once you've memorized this many passages, once you've prayed this many times and given this much money, then poof, the fruit of the Spirit will magically be upon you. No, it is not something that you can earn. It is something that is obtained and achieved by abiding in the Spirit. The other cool thing about the fruit of the Spirit is it's fragile. The fruit of the Spirit must be consistently abiding in Christ so that you can consistently have the ability for the fruit of the Spirit. And here's the other cool thing about the fruit of the Spirit. It reproduces itself. Like if you as a believer go to another believer and you give them grace, or you show them mercy, or you are kind, or if you love them, then they see those things given to them, and then they want to give them to someone else. It's the exact same scenario as paying it forward. If you go through the line at McDonald's and the lady's like, hey, someone paid for your breakfast, you're like, oh, well, I'll pay for the car behind me. It's the same thing with the fruit of the Spirit. It reproduces itself in the way that we give it to others. Others receive it, and then they want to give it to someone else. The fruit of the Spirit is attractive. It's not off-putting. And here's the most important part. The fruit of the Spirit nourishes relationships. It does not divide them. The fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace. Like when you think about your ideal friendships and your ideal relationships, when you look at, at, the, at the, the romance movies that are all crazy and made up but they look really cool 
there's usually love and there's joy and there's peace and there's patience and there's kindness and there's goodness and there's faithfulness and there's gentleness. It nourishes relationships. But here's the important distinction. The fruit of the Spirit is for every believer. The fruit of the Spirit is for every single person that proclaims the name of Christ because these are not gifts, but these are attributes. So we've talked about the gifts of of, um, prophesying and speaking in tongues and healing and all those things. Those are gifts that the Lord gives to individuals for specific causes, for specific uses. The fruit of the Spirit is not a gift. It is not an attribute. It is an attribute. It is something that we should all possess. If you call Christ your Lord and Savior, these things should be true of you. And here's the other important part to note. The word fruit is not plural. It's not the fruits of the Spirit. It is the fruit of the Spirit. Because these are not individual qualities where Ethan may possess the ability to love someone, but I'm more patient. And Kelly has the gift of kindness, but Meredith has the the gift of gentleness. They aren't gifts. They're attributes. And it is one whole attribute that we should possess as believers. They're not spliced. You don't get to pick and choose. Like, yeah, I'll take a little bit of love and, oh, I want to be kind of gentle, so I'll take some gentleness. No. If you call Christ your Lord and Savior, the fruit of the Spirit, all of those things are all encompassing in the way that your life should be described by others, should be shown to others, and should be used to further the kingdom. Every believer should have love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I don't think it's, it's a consequence or a, a coincidence that love is the first one. Because in the scripture we're commanded to love your neighbor as yourself, to love the Lord your God. That love is, is the all-encompassing thing. If you genuinely love someone, you'll be patient with them and you'll be kind to them and you'll remain faithful to them. But here's the crazy thing, that that the way the flesh works, every work of sin is a violation or a perversion of love. Think about it, adultery, uncleanness, uh, cheating, they're all counterfeits of love among people. Idolatry and sorcery are, are counterfeits of a love to God. Hatred, jealousy, Outbursts of anger, selfishness, envy, murder are all opposites of love. Drunkenness and partying are sad attempts to fill the void that only love can fill. They're all direct attacks on the love of Christ. And a Christian should be known by all of the fruit of the Spirit. You see, if you're in the spirit, then these things should be seen in your daily life by believers and unbelievers. In in Rance's message last week, we got to look at the difference of those pictures. In an unbelieving friend, it should be easy to see that you are different. It should be almost a tangible difference of why you are not the same as everyone else in their life. Is your walk with the Lord bearing and showing fruit? Does your life inside of your school show fruit? Does your relationship show fruit? Does your respect for your parents show fruit? Does your speech show fruit? Does your life currently show fruit or does it show self? Does your life show a spirit of Christ or does your life show selfishness? Because a virtual life is evident. Can you point to the spiritual evidence in your life? If we were to call your friends that don't come to Cornerstone and say, hey, can you give us three words to describe this person? Would they describe you as loving and joyful and peaceful? Or would they describe you as something completely different? A virtuous life is evident. Lastly, We're going to jump to verses 25 and 26. It says this. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, or envying one another. And our third point is a virtuous life is humble. 
is humble. And in verse 25, where it says that if we live by the Spirit, we will keep in step with the Spirit. The, this word for step is actually different than the word step in verse 15. This word for step means that you are actually almost like in, in, in a march. Okay, so like in the military, they have these groups that are marching. You see the war movies where they're all marching in unison and in formation. And that's what this is talking about. You are marching under the command of someone else in unison. You are following where they go. And in the same realm of the word, you are also letting them dictate the directions and where you go. And so if we are in the spirit, we are to stay in step with the spirit. If you are in the spirit, you are supposed to be under the command of the spirit, marching the direction that the spirit has you going, going where the spirit calls you to go. How are we doing with that? Do we live in such a way that the Spirit has ownership? Do we listen for the Spirit to tell us where to go and what to say and who to interact with and what school to go to, what job to take? Or do we make these decisions and then go back to the Lord and ask Him to bless what we really wanted all along? You see, it's, it's, it's humble because as you, as you abide in the Spirit and as you, as you have the fruit of the Spirit, as you love people and as you're patient with people, it's really, really easy to get praised and glorified for being those things. So what Paul is saying is, hey, as you do these things, as you walk in the Spirit and as you love people and share the gospel and all these things, stay humble. Don't be conceited. Don't fight with one another and don't envy one another because it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with God. But it's really, really easy to make it about ourselves. When we walk in the Spirit and as we abide in Jesus Christ and as we spend time in His Word, it becomes easier to love people. It becomes easier to be gentle, but it also becomes easier to take the credit for it, like we have earned this or we've done our time and now this is our reward, and we somehow make it about ourselves and not about our Savior. And so a life, a virtuous life, a life that is submitted to the Spirit is a life of humility because you realize and you understand and you fight for the truth that it is not about you. That the way that you love people is not because you are capable of loving them that way, it's because Jesus loved you first and you are just a reflection of Jesus. And so the love that you receive is a love that is now given to others. When you forgive people, it's not because you possess the ability to forgive, it's because that Jesus first forgave you and you are now reflecting and giving the forgiveness that you were first given. Therefore, you cannot take credit for it. A virtuous life is a humble life. And it's really easy that as we live sacrificially, it's really easy to tell people, well, yeah, I was going to do this, but I'm doing this for the Lord. And there's stories about that in the Bible where these, these really rich guys were dumping buckets of money into the tithing place and, and into the, the buckets. And they were doing so intentionally in such a way to make a lot of noise for people to look and see how much money that they were giving to the temple. And then there's this lady that gives one coin, and Jesus said that she has given more than they all have because it was given with a heart of humility, and it, she was really giving all that she had and saying, Father, like, this is yours. And so do we do that with our life? Do we make it about ourselves? Do we, do we lament about our sacrifice? Do we make people aware of the fact of what we're giving up for Jesus to be served or do we just serve the Lord simply for the joy of serving the Lord so that his gospel may be preached and his glory may be spread further through the world. A virtuous life is a humble life. So I want to leave you with, with kind of an illustration. I forgot my, my quarter. But you all know what a quarter looks like, right? Heads and tails? Okay, cool. So imagine there's a quarter in your hand and you're looking at this quarter. On one side of the quarter is heads, and on one side of the quarter is tails, right? If you flip that coin and it lands on the ground, and it's heads or tails, you see one side of that coin, correct? So I want you to imagine that this quarter is your body, and on one side of the quarter is your fleshly desires. It is your sin nature. It is what you want. And the other side of this quarter is the Spirit of Christ. You see, they both occupy your body, but the thing is, is you can only see one side of it at a time. And so my question to you is, what side are people seeing? 
in your life? Are they seeing the side that is abiding in the spirit or are they seeing the side of sin and flesh and selfishness? Because a lot of times I think we kid ourselves and we say, well, I can do this here and I can do this here, but the truth of the matter is, is they're going to see one side of who you are. And it's either going to be your flesh or it's going to be your faithfulness. What side do people see? We can't have it both ways. And in fact, there was a quote that said, for someone, for anyone that wants half of Christ, he has lost Christ entirely. And so for those of us that, that, I think that was Spurgeon, by the way. But for those of us that dip our toes into Christianity and dip our toes into Jesus and say, like, yeah, I'll go to church, but, man, I really want to do this over here. For those people, you have lost Christ entirely. You either have all of Christ, you are abiding in Christ, and you are in Christ, or you don't have Christ at all. And with the same quarter, I think a lot of times we leave our life up to this quarter. Let me explain it to you. How intentional are we in abiding in Christ every day when we get out of bed? Because I think a lot of times we get out of bed and we flip the coin in the air and we let our life and our day and our circumstances decide if we are going to show faithfulness or flesh. I think we flip the coin when we get out of bed and as we get in the car and as we go to school, that coin is still flipping until something happens, either something good where you are then inspired to honor the Lord or something bad where then that coin lands on tails and you say, you know what, today it doesn't matter anymore. I'm going to be angry. I'm going to cuss this person out. I'm going to cheat on this test. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get through the day and that coin is on tails. But what Paul is saying in this passage is that it is not up to chance. And in fact, if you are leaving it up to chance, you've already failed. The coin is already on tails. Because a life, a virtuous life, a life in Christ is an intentional walk. It is an intentional sacrifice. It is an intentional declaration of God. Today, I am yours. The way that I walk, the way that I speak, the people that I hang out with, the gospel that I teach, the way that I treat the people around me, the way that I listen or don't listen to my parents, the way that I engage in this temptation or not is up to you. But I think a lot of times we just let the coin flip. And say, yeah, we'll see what happens. And then we're met with temptation and we're, we're somehow caught off guard that our body wants to sin. And we're like, well, this is going to be my last time. And there's a story. I've told you this story before, but I'm going to say it again because there's a lot of new faces in here. There's a guy in the middle of a field sitting on a fence. And on the left side of the fence is Jesus and glory and angels. And on the right side of the fence is the devil and demons and hell. And Jesus walks to the guy on the fence and he says, hey come with me over here. And he says, yeah, I don't know. And the devil walks over to me and says, hey, come to this side of the fence. Like, it's going to be great. And he says, yeah, like, I don't know. I'm just going to sit on this fence for a while. I don't know which way I want to go. And so Jesus and the devil are like, okay, well, we're going to go back to our places now. We'll see you later. And so Jesus and the angels go over the, the hill and the devil and, and the demons go over the hill and the devil says, oh, wait. And he walks over to the guy on the fence and he says, hey, it's time to go. Come with me. And the guy says, well, I'm, I'm sitting on the fence. And the devil says, yeah, but you don't understand that the fence belongs to me. And what that illustration is, is that if you are on the fence about Jesus, you are, you are not anywhere but on the wrong side of the fence. There is no lukewarm Christianity. There is no straddling righteousness and self. You are either for Jesus or you are against Jesus. And so my question to you tonight is what side of the coin are we going to pursue? What side of the coin are people going to see? What side of the coin do we want people to know us by? What fruit are you going to show people? Because if you squeeze an orange, what juice comes out of it? Orange juice. If you squeeze an apple, what juice comes out of it? Apple juice. When you are hard pressed, whenever you are in the, the depths and the darkness of life and you get squeezed, what juice is going to come out? Is it going to be faithfulness and a dependence on God? Is there going to be anger and selfishness and a dependence on self? And no one can answer that question for you tonight except for yourself. And so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray and we're going to go into groups. Um, let me tell you guys who's over what groups. If you are a middle school girl, you will be with Ale, Kelly, and Shelby. Y'all will be right up here in the front. If you are a ninth grade girl, you'll be with Robin, and we'll put you right over here. Where? 
We'll put you over here in the chairs. 10th grade, you'll be, 10th and 11th grade, you'll be with Meredith. We'll put you all in the back corner. And then 12th grade, you'll be with Amy right over here in the big spot. Uh, for the dudes, uh, middle school, you'll be with Ethan and John, and y'all be right over here in the front. 10th grade, you'll be with Jacob Ostell. Y'all can just go sit with him right there in the back. Uh, 11th is with Sam and Isaac, and y'all can gather right up here in the front. And the 12th, y'all will be with Dane, and y'all will be in the back corner. And think about these things, discuss these things, process these things. Let me pray for you, and then we'll break out into circles. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your message. Thank you for how good you are. And Lord, I pray that some part of this message has, gr has grabbed at least one heart to think about and contemplate their life for you, for your glory. Lord, would you give us the boldness to share in these groups? Would you give us the courage to confess and to ask questions? And Lord, if there are things that are not understood, Lord, would you allow us to just ask questions to gain understanding of who you are and why you've done what you've done and why we should serve you sacrificially, evidently, and humbly, Father. Would you be glorified tonight in everything that takes place, Jesus? We love you. We ask for your spirit upon this place. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You